Greetings and welcome there, Academic Proletariat, to this episode of the Fireside Chats with Mr. Olson, where we will be talking about the non-British colonies. Now, for fear of being labeled an Anglophobe, I'm going to throw in some British colonies too, because we can't get enough of colonial regional difference, especially on short answer questions. Okay, with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and back things up a little bit, and we're going to talk about the major reason why various European powers are here in the New World, and that is none other than the phenomenon known as mercantilism. Now, mercantilism is an economic system in which the mother country, usually one that is in Europe, wants to try and extract as much profit from the economic system as they possibly can. This is very primitive in terms of amassing profits and creating wealth sur surpluses, and that's why it, of course, predates capitalism. Mercantilism will, of course, sow the seeds for capitalism, but you have to get rid of feudalism first, and that's a process that takes place over several hundred years. Anyways, we're here to talk about mercantilism, so again, it is an economic system in which a mother country tries to extract profit from the system in which it is involved. Usually, you do this by finding land overseas stripping that land of its natural resources that you can then either sell at a higher price or turn into manufactured goods. So take, for example, England. They found colonies, predominantly in North America, extracted the raw materials like tobacco, lumber, rice, indigo, whatnot, sold them at a profit either directly to other colonies or it came back to England to be man manufactured. At first, Things will get a little bit messy there in a second. So you need one colonies, you need two people to work on the colonies, in the colonies, and three, you need various economic organizations and economic uh, things like companies to make this mercantilist system work for you. Okay, to drive this point home, let's just watch this quick little clip on mercantilism and hopefully it does a better job than I just did. And believed and valued. Right, so mercantilism was the key economic theory of the British Empire in the 18th century. Because while Adam Smith and David Ricardo were talking up free trade and economic liberalism by 1750, no one was really listening. Mercantilism was basically the idea that the government should regulate the economy in order to increase national power. This meant encouraging local production through tariffs and monopolies, and also trying to ensure a favorable balance of trade. And colonies were an awesome way to create this favorable trade balance because they both produced raw materials and bought back finished goods made from those raw materials. But for it to work, you always need more and more land so you can have more raw materials and more colonists to buy finished goods. By the way, it's important to understand the centrality of slavery in this colonial economy. I mean, the most important colonial trade goods were tobacco and sugar, and both of those crops relied heavily on slave labor. And slaves themselves were a key trade good in the so-called triangular trade between Europe, Africa, and the colonies. As one historian put it, the growth and prosperity of the emerging society of free colonial British America were achieved as a result of slavery. Slave labor. So Britain's greatest rival in the 18th century was France. Like, on paper, the Spanish had a more significant empire in North America, and they'd certainly been there longer, but their empire was really sparsely populated. In fact, by 1800, Los Angeles, the most populous town in Spanish California, had a population of 300 and only 17 freeways. The French colonies were considerably more populous, but even so, by 1750, there were only about 65,000 French colonists, most of them in the St. Lawrence River Valley thereabouts. I don't know, maybe it was somewhere over here. This isn't a terribly detailed map, and also I'm not looking at it. But the French were moving into the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys and forming alliances with American Indians there to try to dominate the fur and deerskin trades, and that proved problematic. So wars usually have really complicated causes, and it's very rare that we can refer to one thing. Okay, so as he alluded to at the end of all this, when you get three competing mercantilist powers, France, Britain, and Spain, on the same continent, vying for the same land, something ugly is going to happen. But we'll kick that can down the line for a couple class periods after this, where we talk about the Seven Years or French and Indian War. Now, it's important to note that in a mercantilist system where colonies are of the essence, you need to have a strong navy. And since Britain had a strong navy, they had the most powerful mercantilist system. As is illustrated by this here uh, advertisement from 1681, it shows you that ships were a little bit of a fetish for the British. 
Now, as he alluded to in that video, it's very important that the mercantilist mother country had maintained strict control over the colonies. So shortly into the, their colonial endeavor, Britain realized that it had to impose laws on the colonies to make sure that they weren't selling things directly to either competitors or other colonies, because when you do that, you can't extract a tax, you can't extract a tax revenue. So in 1660, Britain starts passing a series of mercantilist acts known as the Navigation Acts. These things say that if British colonies are going to produce something, they must go through England before they can be sold to anywhere else. So imagine you are growing tobacco. I just imagine, I'm um, having you imagine yourself as a slave owner. I'm sorry, sorry for that. You're growing tobacco and you want to sell it to somebody in the Caribbean. Well, it has to go to England where it can be taxed and then it can be sold back to the people in the Caribbean that want to buy it. So these mercantilist na navigation acts essentially strengthened Britain's control and Britain by, I mean, the, the, the monarchy's control over trade. That's something to keep in mind, especially as we start to talk about colonists getting their, you know, independence all in a tizzy. Okay, now, you can ask yourself, what was the most influential contribution to this mercantilist system? Was it land? Was it labor? Was it ships? Was it the idea? Well, here's a quote that I'd like you to consider. It says, direct slavery is as much the pivot of our industrialism today as machinery, credit, etc. Without slavery, no cotton. Without cotton, no modern industry. Slavery has given value to the colonies. The colonies have created world trade. World trade is the necessary condition of large-scale machine industry. Slavery is therefore an economic category of the highest importance. Now that is an argument that obviously puts slavery at the centrality of this mercantilist system. Now you might think to yourself, well, who was the brilliant mind that bestowed that knowledge upon us? It was, of course, none other than one Karl Marx in 1847. Anyways, this is a little bit after the mercantilist system was at its peak. When it was at its peak, a lot of people like to refer to it as the triangular trade. Now it's important to note that the triangular trade was not just one triangle but rather, as this map points out, it was a series of triangles. So you could have sent various um, exports from different places to different places, but for the most part, manufactured goods were created and shipped out of Britain to places like West Africa, like the Caribbean, and like North America. And there were slaves that were shipped from Africa to predominantly the West Indies, but then some went to uh, British North, North America, predominantly the colonies in the South. And then raw materials would be shipped from North America and the West Indies to places like Great Britain or like between each other. Because, for example, I can take sugar grown in the West Indies and I can ship it north to the British New England colonies colonies in what's now Boston, they can take that sugar and they can turn it into molasses, which is of course just a liquid form of devil food sugar, and then I can turn that molasses into rum. And that's why Jack Sparrow can ask, why is all the rum gone? Now this of course is centers on slavery being a part of it. So if I were to look at West Africa, I will note that a number, a large number of African slaves were exported from the African continent at this time, and they went all over the New World. Predominantly, they went to places like Brazil and the Caribbean. However, there is a small number that did go to the southern colonies in the United States. Usually, though, slaves would be transported from West Africa to the Caribbean first and then brought to North America. Anyways, it's so crucial that you recognize that the slave trade enriched not only those involved in the direct trading of people, but it enriched all the other industries and businesses that were in the mercantilist system. For example, trade industries like ship and port builders because they built ships to move slaves and they made money off of them, therefore benefiting from slavery. Refiners like tobacco growers, Sugar growers, they obviously benefit from slaves because slaves are doing all the work. Distillers who are making rum obviously couldn't do it without uh, the labor of the slaves in the sugar cane plantations. Manufacturers who are making textiles being used to clothe the slaves or be using uh, the various materials that go into making the textiles that were 
harvested by the slaves. Guns were used to oversee the slaves. Iron products used in shackles. And then obviously there, there were uh, groups in Africa that were, of course, rounding up their people and sending them into the slave trade. So uh, no one part of the world gets off in this slave trade. They're all involved, and therefore any of these endeavors that made money did so on the backs of other human beings. Okay, now on that happy note, let's turn to look at our different colonial regions. We're going to go geographically here and start in New England. Note, we're not starting chronologically with Jamestown. We're going to go geographically with New England. The New England colonies include New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through uh, various aspects of uh, the colonial region. So we'll start with their mission. We're going to do the same thing for all the colonial regions. First, their mission, religious freedom. The English who settled in New England wanted to get religious freedom. They didn't like their religious uh, chaos that was occurring in England and Holland at that time. So the Puritans who initially, or the Pilgrims, I should say, that initially sailed from England to Holland and then over to the New World are looking for freedom to practice their own religion how they want to. Now, economic output in this area is mostly based upon the raw materials available. They built ships out of wood that they had an abundance of. They engaged in a lot of trade, you know, ships and fish, etc. Now, the religion that Dom dominated here was first pilgrims, but mostly Puritans, and that's why we emphasize them first. These were congregational churches, which means that they were local, but that the minister in the area was sort of the middleman between the colonists that were living there and the almighty power. Trailblazers in this area included John Winthrop first. He, of course, is the guy who gave the famous City on a Hill speech, basically saying that the Puritans were a model civilization for all others to look up to. Roger Williams is one who advocated for a looser ties between the religious part of life and the political part of life, so separation of church and state. And Anne Hutchinson, who both fought on behalf of women in the area, but then also asked, do I need a minister to talk to God? I should be able to talk to God on my own. Anyway, she, of course, was banished and eventually killed by natives. Now, the relationship with the Native Americans in this part was initially good, but as time went on, it turned very, very bad because... As families multiplied in New England, more and more land was needed, especially for sons of initial settlers. And as a result of that, they encroached further and further inland. And events like King Philip's War eventually sealed the fate of any good relationship that, was, that had existed between the settlers and the na natives at the outset. Now, each of these colonial regions, while most of them have some sort of turning point that significantly alters the relationship of either the colonists between each other or the colonists and other people there. King Philip's War is one of them. This is going to basically damn the relationship between the natives and the British settlers. The other one is the Salem Witch Trials, which goes to show that the people in New England are have been, you know, uh, straying wildly off course and need to be reined back in and a more closer uh, oversight from England put upon them. Now, after each one of these, I would encourage you to pause yourself and ask this question. How American is this region? Now, that, of course, is a, is a subjective and loaded question in that your definition of American might not be the same as somebody else's. But based on how you see American identity, is this one very American? I would encourage you to pause me at this point and think about that before moving on. All right, so now we go on to the Middle Colonies. The mission of the Middle Colonies was part religious freedom, but mostly to make money. While in Pennsylvania, the Quakers were looking for religious freedom, they still wanted to make money above any sort of religious uh, devotion. That's not something important to keep in mind. They were not as religiously motivated as those in New England, yet they still uh, held religion in high regard. Their economic output was mostly trade, but it also included foodstuffs like wheat and barley and corn. These would be considered the breadbasket of the colonies. Their religion depended on where, where you were. Most of them in Pennsylvania were Quakers, but the Anglican church was also popular, especially in parts of New Jersey and Delaware. Trailblazers in this area would include William Penn, the first governor of Pennsylvania. You might recall that he was given a massive tract of land from the King of England. 
and therefore uh, was able to begin that settlement. Relationship with the natives, compared to the Chesapeake and New England, it was initially very good in that uh, the Quakers had this, you know, uh, a relationship based on pacifism with the natives. They still t took advantage, but as time goes on and there's further encroachment uh, westward, then the relationship with the indigenous people uh, just kind of goes down down the drain. Now, the crisis in this area, there's not really one to identify, so uh, no point in making things more difficult than, than we need to. So at this point, perhaps you should ask yourself, how American is this region? And now we move south where we're going to lump the Chesapeake and the southern colonies together based mostly on their devotion to making money. There's little religious freedom uh, as a mission here, mostly in Maryland, where Cecilius Calvert it settles in hopes of making it like a Catholic utopia. Everyone else was Anglican, though, and they all, above anything, wanted to make money. So that was the major mission of the southern colonies. And their economic output shows that. They grew cash crops. They grew mostly tobacco in the Chesapeake and rice and indigo in the southern colonies. Note, I did not say the C word. Religion here was predominantly Anglican, like I said, with the exception of Catholics in Maryland, uh, but mostly Anglican. Trailblazers here include people like John Smith, of course, who is well known for helping settle Jamestown, Cecilius Calvert, who is well known for helping settle Maryland, and one James Oglethorpe, a guy who helps set up Georgia, which initially is a penal colony where British prisoners go, and it's mostly a buffer. So since British prisoners were an expendable part of the population, they put them in Georgia to, to create this buffer between both the natives on the frontier and uh, Spanish Florida. The relationships with the natives here was bad, very, very bad. In, indicated by uh, the fights between the indentured servants and the Native Americans in Virginia that uh, turned into Bacon's Rebellion, but then also in the southern colonies, when they initially settled there before they relied heavily upon African slaves and before the head right system could really get uh, underway, they took the native population in, into in, enslavement uh, at a higher level than any of the other colonies did. Now down here, the crises are related to uh, work and laborers. So the first crisis occurs in 1676 when a series of indentured servants, freed slaves, um, and small landowners raise up and torch Jamestown and what will be known as Bacon's Rebellion. But then also in the south, South Car Carolina, you see the Stono Rebellion in which slaves rise up against their enslavement in an insurrection where they try to topple the regime. Both of these things, for in the long run, are unsuccessful. However, they both change the institution both of indentured servitude and slavery. Take a minute and evaluate how American is this region. And now we move on to places that aren't Britain. So let's talk about New France. If I were to look on a map, like the one pictured there, you'll note that in the early stages of settlement, France had a substantial amount of land that they claimed to be theirs. Now the difference between French settlement and British settlement is, of course, France is settling inland where the soil is harder to till and the trees are more abundant, and therefore they're going to have to rely on different things to make money. Now, their mission is just that, to make money. There are some Jesuit priests and other uh, Catholic endeavors that come in the name of New France, but for the most part, people are there to make money. Now, the economic output, as I said, very, very different. They're trading with the natives predominantly in furs. So if you think about this, a French fur trapper can walk into a forest, trap an animal, and leave without upsetting the ecosystem or the relations with the natives very, very much. As a result of that, we see a different relationship ensue between the French and their native counterparts. Now, their religion, as I said, they're predominantly Catholic. Um, however, that's sort of a side, side note, unless you're talking specifically about the Jesuits. Trailblazers include Samuel de Champlain, who is one of the first to come into the St. Uh, Lawrence River Gap and uh, help establish French settlements. Now, relationships with the natives, as I said, great relatively. I'm not saying great as in they were, you know, chummy all the time, but the French were much more readily willing and 
uh, did intermarry with the natives. They had a symbiotic relationship, meaning that they both relied on one another. The natives relied upon the French to give them manufactured goods, and the French relied upon the natives uh, to help them trap furs. But since the, the French weren't ruining the land, the natives were more uh, likely to stomach uh, their, their relationship. The turning point for New France is going to be the Seven Years' War, which is where mercantilism absolutely implodes, and there's a battle between the three European powers over North America. That'll be something that we talk about later on. So ask yourself, how American is this region? And now we move to New Spain, pictured there in the red. New Spain's mission, and hopefully for those of you that took world history, is no secret, make money and find religious converts. Their economic output is mostly gold and silver extraction. They want to make money and they want to make it quick, but they also institute more long-term commitments like the encomienda system, which of course is a deal between uh, settlers and the king that says you can have the native labor and you can work them in exchange uh, for converting them to Christianity, which would, of course, bring in more of a revenue. Their religion, they are staunchly Catholic. Trailblazers include, among others, Hernan Cortez, Don Juan de Onate, Hernando de Soto, the last two of which uh, explored and uh, helped map out North America as opposed to modern-day Mexico. Relationships with the natives, terrible. I would argue second worst to the English, the only reason that I would argue that the English are worse is uh, because their plantation system is just a little bit more aggressive in terms of taking up new land. Crises are turned, turning points. First, the Spanish Armada in 1588, which changes the balance of power in the world from Spain to Great Britain. But then also the Pueblo Revolt in 1680, where several uh, Native American tribes in the southwest part of what is now the United States, rose up against their, their Spanish oppressors because the Spanish were not abiding by or honoring Native American religious customs. As a result of this, though, the Pueblos kind of descend into chaos, and despite winning, ask the Spanish to come back several years later, but when they come back, the Pueblos are granted religious freedom, something that they didn't have before. So ask yourself here, how American is this region? And as you do that, you might want to take note that one of the ways that the Spanish made their presence felt in the American Southwest was by the building of missions like this one. If I were to look at a map, you will find that there were several areas that the Spanish built religious missions um, throughout. And that was a way for them to both recruit uh, new converts, but then also oversee uh, their endeavors in the area. And then finally, it brings us to the Dutch. Can you find the Dutch on that map? Not really, because they don't really have a presence. Anyways, it was in and around modern-day New York, which was initially settled as New Amsterdam when the Dutch supposedly bought it from some Native Americans for $24. Now, their mission for the Dutch, always to make money. They don't care about anything else. They're going to do it, though, through trading and commercial ventures. So perhaps loaning money, perhaps serving as a bank, but definitely involved in trading. Their religion is money. No secret there. Trailblazers, not any that we really need to take note of. Relationship with the Native Americans, it's okay, actually. It's focused on trade, and therefore they rely upon each other. The Dutch are most like the French in terms of their relationship with the, na na with the Native Americans. It's uh, a lot of reciprocity there, unlike the British and the Spanish, who, you know, well, you know. The turning point here is in 1664 when the English basically forced the Dutch to leave at gunpoint, but at this point the Dutch had found uh, more lucrative endeavors in Southeast Asia, which is where they had to put all their money into spices like nutmegs and cloves. All right, so take a moment. How American is this region? And that, my friends, are the colonial regions. And I ask you, is there any better place in the world to make money than America? That's all the time I got. Stay classy.